You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. Here's the sad thing, verse 40. But you're not willing to come to me that you might have life. Isn't that a tragedy? I want you to have life through the scriptures, but you missed the whole thing. By the way, notice it doesn't say here, Jesus doesn't say, but you can't come to me. He doesn't say that. No, but you don't want to come. Anybody can come. You're here today, you can come to Jesus. God's not holding you back one bit, and he wants you to come forward. His desire is that you receive his new life. It's free, a new beginning. He wants you to have it. These men didn't want it. We tend to seek God's assistance only when we are in need or ask him to deliver us from a terrible situation. When God gives us what we want, we often turn away from him and continue on our own path. Pastor Ron explains in today's message how you can begin to develop a relationship with Jesus. Instead of relying completely on yourself, you can start putting your trust in Jesus to guide you in the right direction. Your Creator knows what's best for you. How can you start putting your faith in Jesus at all times? Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of John chapter 5 with today's edition of Large Than Life. One of the religious leaders got it. In fact, he was part of the Sanhedrin, top, part of the top 70 in Israel. His name was Nicodemus, remember? The original Nick at night, right? He comes to Jesus at night, and he says these words to Jesus in John 3, 2. Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. He made the connection. And this is why Peter, on the day of Pentecost, the church's first sermon said in Acts 2, 22, said, men of Israel, he was gathering everybody. Listen, men of Israel, hear the words of Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to God to you. How? By miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. In other words, this is not a secret. You've all seen the miracles which he did. He's the Messiah. He's God. And so Jesus says here, my works, they bear witness that I'm God. And by the way, they weren't few in number, right? They they were many. And they weren't done in a corner. They were done in front of thousands of people. And not only that, they weren't small occurrences that could have been explained, right? Jesus wasn't healing people of back pain. Brother, your back pain's been made well. Little boy, your toothache's been made well. Now, Jesus might have healed those minor aches and pains, but he didn't do these little small things. No, no, no. Jesus proved his power over sickness and disease by giving new skin to the people who were leprous, that had bulbous sores. He demonstrated his power to restore limbs, new nerves, and muscles instantaneously in this chapter to a guy who had been paralyzed 38 years. Amazing. He touched deaf ears and made them to hear. He touched blind eyes and made them to see. He touched dead limbs and made them to walk. He showed his power over the cosmos by stopping a raging storm with the very word of his mouth. He showed his power over the limitations of time and space by healing a man 20 miles away with just saying the word, with a command. He he showed his power over space and matter by creating out of five loaves and two fish enough food to feed over 5,000. He showed his power over Satan and demons by causing them to flee with the very word of his mouth. And he showed his power over death, raising people from the dead, not once, not twice, but three times. And then when he himself was in the grave, three days, he raised himself from the dead. I suggest to you that is power. And that testifies of who Jesus is. Jesus did miracle after miracle, sign after sign, wonder after wonder. Why? Well, it's to really support what we sing in the song this time of the year. Let earth receive her king. That's what his works testified. I'm the king. I'm God. And so Jesus says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, well, there's two right there. Let's talk about a third one. And it's the witness of the father. The witness of the father. Verse 37. And the father himself who sent me has testified of me. So he says, if that's not enough, God the Father himself has said, I'm God. I'm the Son of God. In fact, the Father did it audibly so others could hear three times. Three times. Now, the first is found in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16 when Jesus was being water baptized. It says, uh, when he had been baptized, he, he came up out of the water immediately. 
and behold, the heavens were opened. Now, John also saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. But suddenly, out of the heavens, a voice came audibly. It's the Father saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Well, that's a pretty thunderous, uh, you know, affirmation right there. God speaking out of heaven. I've always thought in my mind, to be honest with you, when it comes to bringing people to Jesus, I thought, well, God, why don't you just part up the heaven and say, I'm God. Stick your head out and say, I'm God. I'm real. Follow me. To me, that would work. Just saying. But the funny thing is that God has chosen to use instruments like you and me. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? He wants to use us to be the conduits of his grace. A second occasion when, is when Jesus was transfigured before his disciples. In Matthew chapter 17, it tells us he took with him Peter, James, and John up on the mountaintop, and there he was transfigured, metamorphosed, it says in the original language, in front of them. And what does that mean? Well, it describes it. It says he allowed him to see some of his deity. It says his face shone like the sun. Same description we have in the book of Revelation. Jesus allows them to see a portion of his deity without them being blown away. And it tells us also, at the same time, Elijah and Moses show up. Now, why would those two show up? Well, Moses, we understand, because he's the lawgiver. He wrote the first five books of the law. Moses represents the law. Elijah, well, he's the prophets. So what you have is the law and the prophets, which, by the way, the Jews called the entirety of the Old Testament, the law and the prophets. You have the law and the prophets looking to Jesus saying, this is God, this is the Messiah. So you have that proof in and of itself. But as this is happening, it tells us Peter got all excited. He's like, oh, wow, mind blower. You know, if he was from California, he'd go, Dude, awesome. Whoa, let's make like three tents over here, you know? So he says, let's make tents. One for Moses, one for Elijah, one for JC. And we're just, it's gonna be awesome. And it tells us while he was speaking, all of a sudden a cloud overshadowed them. A voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then it says, says this, hear him. In other words, Peter, shut up. This is God. I love that. That's pretty awesome. Then there was a third occasion. We find it in John's account, just a few chapters ahead. In chapter 12 and verse 28, Jesus is praying. And he's saying, Father, glorify your name. And then it says, a voice from heaven was heard saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So God the Father clearly testified of Jesus' deity. But notice this, verse 37. But... You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. Why? Because you do not have his word abiding in you. Wow, talk about an indictment to the religious leaders. His word's not abiding in you? I thought these guys know the scriptures. Yes, and Jesus picks up on that in a moment. But it's not abiding in you. Why? How do we know it's not real? It's not there in their heart. He says, because whom he sent, which is me, him you do not believe. He's saying, you don't know anything of the Father. You don't know anything of God. Why? Because you don't know anything of me. And by the way, this is the tragedy of all cults. There are many cults in the United States, JWs, Mormons, Baha'is. There are many others. And here's the thing. They will say, we worship the Father, we worship God, but they don't. But they sing songs even to God, but they don't. Why? Because they don't worship the Son in equality with the Father. They don't recognize Jesus Christ as God. And because they don't recognize him as God, they don't worship God. It's empty worship, how sad, to be so close yet so far away. So what is the testimony of the Father? Well, we could say it's the audible voice of God testified three times that Jesus is the Messiah, he's the Son of God, true. But we could also say that it's the internal voice of God as well, which only the true believer possesses because he says, you don't know it. You guys haven't heard it because they haven't accepted me. But when you accept me as Savior, you hear the voice of God. You know the voice of God. How do we know this? Because we have a great verse in 1 John 5, 9. It says this. If we receive the witness of man, the witness of God is greater than that. For this is the witness of God. Here it is. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. In other words, the Father testifies, this is the Son. By the way, not only the Father testifies that, so does the Holy Spirit. We read in Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. But it's not only the Father that does it. It's not only the Spirit. Jesus says even himself, because he says in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice, 
and I know them and they follow me, they hear me. So we hear the father, which the message is the son. We hear the message of the son saying, follow me. We hear the message of the spirit. It's all combined, father, son, Holy Spirit. But there is an inner testimony for sure, to be sure. But nonetheless, Jesus makes it clear. We have the witness of the father. So he says, look it, my testimony is enough, but I understand that's not enough for you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, the Bible says, let something be established. I've given you three. The witness of the forerunner, the witness of my works, the witness of the Father. But I'm going to go beyond that. Let's talk about one more. The witness of the scriptures. Verse 39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. Now, the word search here um, can be translated two different ways, both of which, by the way, are correct. It can be translated as either an imperative, which makes it a command, or indicative, which makes it a statement. If you take it as an imperative, Jesus is giving them a command. He's saying, you need to search the scriptures. You need to go over them again because you think you have eternal life, but you don't because then you haven't accepted me. You need to go back over them again. As an indicative, as a statement, he could be saying, guys, you need to search the scriptures because you think you're saved, but you need to reread it again because you think you have eternal life and you don't because they testify of me and you've missed the whole point, you see. Either way you take it, we understand that the the religious leaders were deep into God's word, right? They were deep into the Old Testament scriptures. My goodness, they even wore the scripture on them. Have you ever seen, has anybody ever seen a Jewish person wearing phylacteries? Have you ever seen those? Some of you have seen it. It's, It's a crazy sight when you see, if you haven't seen it before, you're gonna go, what is going on? Because they have these little boxes made out of leather, which they put the scriptures in from Deuteronomy chapter six and a few other passages. And, and these leather straps of the leather box attached to a, a, uh, attached to a base with leather straps that would go three feet long. And they'll put this thing on the wrist. They wrap this thing all around them. And then they'll put it on their forehead and wrap it all around over there. You go, my goodness, what's going on? Well, they're, they're wearing the word of God. That's how deep they're into it. But the tragedy is, of even wearing it and memorizing it. They miss the truth of of Jesus. This is something that could even happen to people today. Thinking that we have an intellectual understanding of the scriptures. Oh, we think we're good. That's how the religious leaders were. They thought they were shoo-ins for salvation. They were smug and complacent in their rites and rituals, in their sacrifices and Sabbaths, in their traditions and their teachings. And over time, this intellectual diversion blinded them from the very truth of the scriptures. And so we need to ask ourselves as we read the scriptures and we should be reading them. If you're not even reading the scriptures, I have to ask myself, are you saved? There's another thing that's gonna offend somebody. Oh, I liked it for a season. I don't like to hear that one. But wait a second. Listen, are you married? If some of you, a lot of you are married. We got married, didn't, didn't, didn't you like to read letters that come from your loved one? Don't you like reading a card from your loved one? Of course you do. Jesus wrote in the scriptures to you because he loves you. I want to read more about my Savior, his love for me. I want to know more about him. So as you're reading your scriptures, which I'm just taking that as a given, we need to be careful that we're not reading it just for intellectual study. But we need to read it to know more about Jesus that we fall in love with him. J.C. Laney wrote these words. Eternal life is not found in the word as an end to itself the paper, the ink, the letters, the sentences, but through the word as it points to Jesus. To miss the deity of Jesus, to miss the grandeur of who he is and what he's done is to miss the whole thing. Paul commended Timothy because he did it the right way. In 2 Timothy 3.15, he said, from a childhood, you've known the scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation. You read the word, but you read it and it led you to Christ. Oh, that's so important because there are millions and millions of people who read maybe the scriptures, but they become religious and they miss the whole point. I love it when I meet someone that says, you know, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can accept Christ. I'm not the religious type. I'm like, great, great. You're perfect. You're the perfect candidate because God's not into religion. He's into a relationship, right? C.H. Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers of all time, said this, beware of the study of doctrine, precept, or experiences apart from the Lord Jesus. Doctrine without Jesus is nothing better than his empty tomb. It's empty. So it's one thing to have the scriptures in our hand. It's another thing to understand the truth in our hearts. 
So speaking of the scriptures, Jesus says, these are they that testify of me. And we need to understand that. Listen, all of the Old Testament pointed to Jesus. All of the types, all of the prophecies, all of the ceremonies, all of the feasts, all of the patterns, it all pointed to Jesus. Do you remember when Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday morning? And he was walking with a few of the disciples so discouraged they didn't even know that Jesus was now walking with them. And this is what it says in Luke 34, 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, that's the Old Testament, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Why? Because the scriptures are all about him. Here's the sad thing, verse 40. But you're not willing to come to me that you might have life. Isn't that a tragedy? I want you to have life through the scriptures, but you miss the whole thing. By the way, notice it doesn't say here, Jesus doesn't say, but you can't come to me. He doesn't say that. No, but you don't want to come. Anybody can come. You're here today, you can come to Jesus. God's not holding you back one bit, and he wants you to come forward. His desire is that you receive his new life. It's free, a new beginning. He wants you to have that. These men didn't want it. Jesus continues, verse 41, I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. Now, Jesus is not saying that I don't want honor or praise. Jesus wants honor. Jesus wants praise. But he wants it only from those who love him. Jesus doesn't want feigned hypocritical worship. He doesn't want calloused religion. He wants hearts that honor him because they love him. So Jesus says, I don't receive your honor because God's love is not in your heart. Verse 43, I've, I've come in the Father's name and you do not receive me. I, I came in the name of the Father, as John testified. This is the Lamb of God. The scriptures testify, but you have not received me. Yet, verse 43, if another comes in his own name, him you'll receive. Now, what is Jesus talking about? Well, there's coming a day when a man who is called in the scriptures the Antichrist is gonna come in the scene. He's gonna come in the power of his own name and they will receive him open arms. Now listen, if you go over to Israel today or you have the opportunity to talk to a practicing Jew, not a secular Jew, but a practicing Jew, they will tell you that there is a, an expectation for a coming Messiah. And if you ask him, well, how do you know that that's your Messiah? Oh, I know, because he's gonna rebuild our temple for us. He's gonna rebuild our temple. Well, that's very scary. Because we're told in Daniel chapter 9 that there's coming a man who will rebuild the temple. He's going to make a peace, a pact with, with Israel. And he's going to rebuild the, the temple right there in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. And for three and a half years, there's going to be a lot of peace. It's going to be awesome. Yay, yay, we picked the right guy. Until three and a half years are up. Then he's going to walk into the temple. He's going to stop temple sacrifice. And he's going to proclaim himself God. And anyone who doesn't worship him, take his mark, will be killed. That's the Antichrist. So Jesus says, me you won't receive, but there's gonna come another man in his own name and him you'll receive. What a tragic, horrible day of deception that will be. He continues, verse 44, how can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from God? So not only will you another, oh, honor another man in the future, but instead of honoring me, you honor, it says right here, one another. And man, this is what the religious leaders did by the time of Christ. They had just gotten so far off, all they wanted to do is honor one another. I honor you, brother. Oh, I honor you. I have a reward for you, brother. I have a reward for you. And Jesus, in a most powerful way, read Matthew chapter 23. The whole chapter's about that. I'll just read one little segment. In verse six, he says they love the best places at the feast. They love the best places in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplace when everybody sees them. Oh, Rabbi, you're so awesome. That's what they wanted. They wanted the praise of one another. But they never sought to honor God in sincerity. As a result, Jesus says to him in verse 45, do not think that I shall accuse you to be father. So you're worried about judgment? I won't do it. There's one who accuses you. It's Moses in whom you trust. Ooh, now Jesus has stepped on their toes. Moses, we venerate Moses. He was the most honored man within the religious system. He was the giver of the law. He's the father of the faith, right? Because he gave, he was the law giver. When you read the scriptures, even today, they always make sure they read a passage of scripture from the Pentateuch. But Jesus says, the one you love, the one you venerate, he will be your judge. And they're probably thinking to themselves, how can that be? Jesus tells him, verse 46, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Again, all the scriptures are about me. 
The prophets, yes, but all of the law is about me. Listen, Jesus is the ark of Noah. Jesus is the ark. When a person places their faith in Jesus Christ, there is safety. God seals the door, and you will judge above the, the judgment waters for eternal life. Jesus is the ark of Noah. Jesus is Jacob's ladder. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Jesus is the manna from heaven. Jesus is the water from the rock. He's all of it. All of the ceremonies pointed to Jesus. All of the sacrifices pointed to Jesus. All of the feasts pointed to Jesus. They searched the scriptures. They read the writings of Moses and they failed to see Jesus. And Jesus says, Moses will be your judge. Verse 47 for if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? If you won't read, believe the writings of your national hero, if you miss all of it, though you read it every time in the synagogue, every day, you won't believe in me. Moses was all about Jesus through prophecy. They didn't know it. And so rather than change, as we know, we saw this back in verse 18 of this very chapter. Already earlier on, they sought to kill him. And this would only solidify him. They would take him eventually to a cross and crucify him. They'll reject him. But why? Understand, not out of ignorance. They won't reject him out of ignorance. Why? Because Jesus has given them these witnesses as he has given us these witnesses. These witnesses testify of his deity. They stand as great pillars for our faith as well. That Jesus Christ is who he said he is, that he is God. We have the witness of John the Baptist. We have the witness of his very works. We have the witness of the Father himself. And we have the witness again and again and again of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation to see that Jesus Christ is God incarnate. And that's what we worship this time of the year, that God became a man, born a baby. That's not an infant, though he is. He's also the infinite God of the universe. And so Jesus can definitively say then in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And you won't be able to go to the Father unless you come through me. You won't be able to go to heaven unless you come through me because I and the Father were one. And I came down to sacrifice for you. And so you have all this from the very beginning to the end. In fact, in the last book in the Bible, Revelation, repeatedly he's giving, he's giving pleas to turn to him. I'll give you one. In Revelation 3.20 he says, Behold, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. And that, I suggest to you, is what he's been doing this whole message if you don't know Jesus. He's knocking on your heart. He says, I knock, and if anyone hears my voice, well, we've heard his voice clearly through the scriptures today. If any man hears my voice and will open the door, that's your heart. If you would just simply just, okay, Lord, I give. You're knocking, I hear it. And I would open the door, open your heart. He says, I'll come in. I'll come in, I'll dine with you, I'll fellowship with you. I'll change you. You don't even have to go, well, I can't. I, I don't know where to begin, how to change. Don't worry about it, he'll do the changing. All you gotta do is say, I give. And he'll, oh yeah, I like that. God says, I'll work, I'll work. And he will. You say, Ron, what, what I gotta do? What, what's it gonna take, what do I gotta do? I always like to boil it down. There's many ways, but for this morning, we'll say it's as easy as A, B, C. That's pretty simple. God's made it so simple. We don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops, just A, admit you're a sinner. That's not hard. We all know we sin. The Bible says we all sin and come short of the glory of God. We all sin. That's self-evident. And because we sin, we need to recognize that and turn from where we've been going. We need to repent. Acts 3.19 says, repent that you might be converted, that you might be forgiven of your sins. So repentance means to turn around. Repentance simply makes do 180. That's it. Make an about face. I've been living my life doing my own thing, and now I'm turning around and saying, God, I need to do it your way. So admit, A, admit you're a sinner and repent of that sin. B, believe. Acts 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you could be saved. Isn't that what it's all about? Isn't that what Jesus said in here? I've said all this so you might be saved. You could be saved. Confess Jesus. Place your faith in Jesus. Believe. But there's a final thing, and that's C. That's what I call commitment. Be willing to make a commitment. You can make that commitment. You've just heard Pastor Ron Hint and the radio ministry of Calvary Houston here on Large Than Life. Pastor Ron's currently in the Gospel of John. John is one of the four books in the Bible that describes the life, ministry, and teachings of Jesus Christ. 
In his short time here on earth, Jesus changed the world and the entire course of human history through his life, death, and resurrection. Whether you joined us halfway through our program today or you caught just the ending, we'd encourage you to visit the link that provides this message in its entirety and other messages like this one. All you have to do is visit ltlradio.org and click on the teaching archive. Do you feel like you're constantly on the go with no time to slow down? You're not alone. And the good news is we've got you covered. You can listen to more of Pastor Ron's message by downloading our mobile app, which is available on our website, ltlradio.org. Were you aware that Larger Than Life is also in podcast form? All you have to do is subscribe. So don't leave that website without doing that. Are you in the Friendswood, Texas area? Do you have a church you call home? If not, we'd like to invite you to join our community as we worship Jesus together. Service times and directions can be found on our website, ltlradio.org. That's all the time we have for today, but we hope you join us again to hear more great teachings right here on Larger Than Life.